Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Today's guest is Edmonton. Yes, I said that correctly. Edmonton City <laughs> Council ked- candidate for the Ward of Papasteo, Kirsten Goa. Kirsten, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Um, Kirsten, uh, uh, as uh, my listeners and my viewers have known, we've been talking about Calgary City Council, but municipal elections are happening across this great province and particularly happening in Edmonton, where you are. So uh, I want to thank you so much for sitting down talking to me, but let's get the first question out of the way so that way we can jump into this. So that way you can get back to campaigning. Um, (laughs) Where's your sense of duty come from? Um, I'm glad, like I was listening to some of your podcasts and I was like, oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, When I think about duty, I think mostly about duty of care. So you know, I think that sometimes we think about duty in terms of duty and obligation, but um, I, I think I was born, um, frankly, with a very strong sense of um, justice and fairness and care and concern for the world around me. Like it, it's kind of, my mom tells a story when I was like under two and they have a whole bunch of people over they're having you know a lively conversation and one of my favorite pieces of renaissance dance music came on in the background and I started dancing in the middle of the living room and immediately almost grabbed my parents and started inviting them up to come and dance and went around and eventually picked up brought everyone into the circle except for one person and that person was um, someone who I'd never met before who was quite shy and I just kept looking over and all of the adults are starting to feel awkward because like the toddler hasn't included this one person, right? But they're not gonna like bring him into the doubts because this is the toddler's thing, right? So it's very, they start to get awkward and, and I keep looking over there and dancing and looking over there and dancing. And eventually I stepped out of the circle and I reached out and brought him into the circle. And, you know, my mom tells that story a lot because over and over again, you know, and sometimes to my own detriment, because, um, you know, there's things about empathy and boundaries. <laughs> um, but, you know, I looked around the world and I saw issues, people, creatures um, that needed to be taken care of. And I saw things that weren't fair. And, um, and I really wore my heart on my sleeve. Um, with that. Uh, I still do some moderation at this point, but that's, that's really at the heart of it for me is that we, we all live in relationship. We're all connected and we need to take care of each other. Well, you, you can give back and your, your sense of duty can come from a lot of places and yours. It sounds like you you do wear your heart on your sleeve when you're telling that story. Um, But you can give back in multiple avenues. Mm -hmm. You've chosen to give back by running in a municipal election. Um, so I, I got to ask, and this is usually the, the, the oddball question, but are you the political oddball in your family? Were your, fam- were your mother and father political or did politics sort of come from your family or is it just yourself? Um, sort of both. So my parents aren't, so I think there's a difference between big P and small P political. And so my parents weren't, they didn't run for office. They weren't like heavily involved in sort of the electoral process, either in a party sense or, um, or otherwise. Um, but they were very interested in community and sort of small people political issues. Um, I, in retrospect, I only realized this last election when I ran, um, I knew a lot of people who'd run for office at the municipal level when I was a kid. Um, without really realizing that we were a political household. So I grew up in Strathcona, which is a bit of a political hotbed in in Edmonton. And, um, you know, and I grew up with the stories about old family friends of ours, the Nethers, and and the community gathering around and stopping the um, freeway construction through the Mill Creek Ravine. Um, and, And, you know, it sort of grew from there. So those kinds of conversations that my parents were having in the living room when I was a toddler, 
a lot of them were sort of political and philosophical in nature and really fo but focused on the issues of the world and the issues of the day, as well as what we could do about it in our own neighborhoods. So in that sense, I grew up in a very political household, um, but I didn't realize it. And um, it was really, you know, I, I wanted to make a difference. I'm like, I, I joined every organization. I got memberships to things. I went to protests, burnt myself out many times, was sat on boards. Um, and it was when I sort of encountered community organizing work around 12, 13 years ago now, um, that I realized that there was a way for us to do the relational work that came somewhat naturally to me, but and that I thought was important, but that we could do that on purpose. And if we did that on purpose and we did it across sectors and interests, that it meant that we could actually build sort of power together. And that was really transformative for me. So I think I came by it naturally in the sense of my family having that sort of orientation um, towards community and towards involvement. But um, I also didn't think that I would ever run for office. I, I when Jan Reimer lost the election in 1995, I was 21 and I vowed I would never run because it was too nasty for women. Wow. Um, right. let, so you, you mentioned briefly there that you did run in 2017. I just want to make sure that I get my math here correct. Four years ago was 2017 yes. as much as we yeah. don't really know what day of the week it is these sometimes. Um, but in 2017, you put your name forward to run for city council in, I'm assuming, the same ward area that you're running in now, uh, yet the boundaries have shifted a little bit in Edmonton, but in the same area, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah. So, I mean, in this part of the city, the boundaries changed quite a bit. So I ran in what is currently Ward 8 um, and um, Ward Pepisteo overlaps with kind of half of Ward 8 and then about half of Ward 10 with a few neighborhoods from Ward 11 thrown into the mix. So it is a big change from last election, but but yes, I ran where I lived last time and I'm running where I live this time too. So let, let's talk about this campaign. This, this mm -hmm. is a interesting year that we are in uh, with COVID-19. Why decide to put your name forward again? You had the, you ran in 2017, but you decided that with everything going on in the world, this is the perfect time to run for <laughs> elections in, in Alberta, in the world in 2021, when there's a global pandemic happening. So what was the main factor about doing that? So, yeah, you know, so like I said, I had originally planned to never run. And then it was like, well, maybe I'll run someday. And then it was 2015 when I decided that I had to run in 2021. Yes, one <laughs> And then I had a long back and forth with myself that was really stressful last election before I decided to finally put my name in the ring. So I put my I only launched my campaign on June 8th last election. And so, and part of that was that I knew I wanted to run this election and I knew I needed to do the work, establish myself. Um, obviously I wanted to win last election. I gave our incumbent a little bit of a scare, at least he, so he tells me. Um, but, you know, I also knew that that was a long shot and that I needed to lay the groundwork for this election. So why run this election? I mean, I must say like our current circumstances are daunting. Um, and uh, there have been many times where I'm a little bit in the fetal position going, what am I taking on here? I've spent a thousands of hours doing work um, on city issues. And so I'm pretty cognizant of what we're looking at in terms of, you know, some of the really challenging social issues we're dealing with, um, economic challenges, the relationship that is fraught with the province, um, the limitations we have in terms of our, you know, revenue streams, as well as the major, major sort of visionary processes. Like we're in the process of rolling out new waste management. We rolled up out a new bus network redesign. We've got a new city plan. Now we're trying to do district planning. Like it's, and then of course there's a global pandemic um, and no big crisis, et cetera. So, and oh, a climate crisis in there. So yeah, um, that's a lot. Um, and I'm not naive to the fact that this next term is going to be extremely difficult. Um, 
And, but that's also a part of the reason why I am running because I think we need a kind of politics that can bring the temperature down, that meets people where they're at in community to help sort of scaffold them into the conversations about all of the changes and disruption that we're facing. Because like we can have the best plan in the world. And I really, I was quite involved in our city plan and I got some, you know, I've spent a lot of time on how we need to change the city, but we're not gonna meet those goals if we don't bring people along in that process. And the work on the ground with community, bridging different interests, spending a fair bit of time listening to people's fears and anxieties and helping move conversation to a place of like, what do we wanna love and take care of and build on as our communities are changing rather than trying to like move into this sort of um, very natural defensive mode that is so common. I, I really think that, that it's, it's about the work that needs to be done, but it's also about how we do that work. And that is a piece that I bring to the table and that I've focused on for many, many years now. And um, it's really easy to move into sort of a reactionary oppositional mode in a crisis. And we can't afford to do that because we will not solve these problems that way. So you have just unloaded a lot of questions that I have for you now. So hopefully you have time to answer them. Um, my, my first question has to be, um, the, the global pandemic has shown the disparity between the 1% and the 99%. You are seeing the rich get richer and the, and the 99% potentially stagnant or potentially falling behind. You're seeing the rise in of vagrancy and houselessness, because I've been told that is mm -hmm. the correct term now, houselessness issues. How does a municipality moving forward, especially Edmonton, because you were ranked one of the best places to live during the global pandemic, how do you ensure that the people who are struggling are not left behind? Because I'm assuming when you're talking to people, when you're door knocking, when you're out canvassing, you're hearing these struggles that people are going through, whether it be uh, taxes, utility rates, whether it be even federal issues. So because mm -hmm. municipalities, like you say on your website, is the frontline politics. So how do we ensure that people who are getting, aren't being left behind as we recover from this global pandemic? Yeah, and that's like the one million dollar question. Um, we're, we are, we're seeing what they sometimes talk about as like a K recovery, right? We see some people doing very, very well and a whole bunch of others um, really not. Um, and, and so, you know, the city has limited revenue streams and, um, and is looking at and, and limited jurisdiction. And at the same time, um, we, we have some really important opportunities for um, how we prioritize the resources we have. You know, fundamentally, um, our city has been built by the investment of Edmontonians over um, millennia, long before it was called Edmonton. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we have a responsibility to take care of those investments and then also to invest in our future. And that means investing in the people. And especially when we're dealing with um, all of these crises, uh, making sure that people can, you know, are safe, can, can grow and thrive is um, our ability again to, to navigate the disruption is going to be predicated on our ability to respond to these, um, to these issues. They, so, you know, the housing, the, the issue with houselessness is, is significant. And I live really close to the river Valley and moving system. And we, you know, part of the challenge we're facing, I think around even like the policing of camps, which supposedly we're going to do a bit better this time, but, you know, a two week turnaround time to get people attached to supports and resources, especially when those supports and resources are also constrained, um, isn't adequate. Like, you know, so we, we need to have a lot more compassion sort of built into the culture of our organizations. And then very concretely, um, we, one of the things we do have as a city is land. 
And so we have opportunities to be building a lot of housing. And we are like the city has actually really taken leadership on this because it's a ball that's been dropped by the level of government that's primarily responsible. Um, obviously, that takes time to build new housing, but we also have existing housing. And there, you know, one of the challenges I see is that we have mature neighborhoods. Uh, most of this, this word is all mature neighborhoods, and it's where I grew up, but um, where, you know, housing affordability has really changed. And so we need to be looking at, at making sure that we can provide, you know, a place to call your own and safe shelter um, for, for people who are our neighbors who live currently in a river valley system or in our parks. Um, but we also need to be looking at the full scale of the affordability spectrum. And, you know, when we see that women are, you know, at employment rates of that in the 80s, um, we see a lot of issues with um, access to housing for kids, um, for seniors wanting to downsize in their community where they lived. Um, there's a really significant range of issues related in particular to the housing question um, that, that needs to be wrestled with. And, and we've made a fair bit of progress on some of those issues over the last few years, but we need to be accelerating that progress. And again, like I, I'm getting messages from folks who are really concerned about supportive housing projects in their neighborhood. And like, we need to scaffold folks into that process. And it's easy to say, oh, they're just NIMBY and they don't, you know, we shouldn't listen to them. But, you know, we are just going to poke the bear. Like we need to help people manage their fears so that they can actually engage more effectively because otherwise it's all going to be an uphill fight and it's already an uphill fight. So there's there's that in allocation piece in terms of where we put our resources and, and fundamentally we're going to make really difficult decisions this time uh, in terms of our budget. But those resources that we do have need to be invested in the places with the greatest need um, that and along we need to align it with our city plan and we need to align it with um, the needs of the most vulnerable in our city. And, and that needs to be a question we ask of every every line item in our budget. Well, and yet again, you've opened up a few can of worms <laughs> there that I want to talk about, but uh, I want to go back to one of the statements that you just made was uh, the ward of Papastoa is a well-established uh, area. It is a traditionally uh, older type of area because it was one of the first uh, areas that was uh, built in Edmonton. What are you hearing at the door? What are you hearing from the people who have been there for 50 to 60 years? Because on your website, you have an amazing page that is that places for people. And if you read it, you get a sense that the longevity of people who live in your ward or the ward that you would be potentially representing after October 18th um, are Edmontonians who have been there for 50, 60 years. So what are you hearing is their biggest concerns for the future, for the next four years, mm -hmm. for you to take forward to the city hall as their next city councilor? So, so there's, there's some tensions in, in what I hear. I mean, people are, you know, really protective of their homes and for good reason, homes supposed to be the safe place that stays the same. And, and so there's a lot of anxiety about issues like infill, intensification, um, you know, and at the same time, there's a desire for significant, um, you know, protections of our river valley and, um, you know, maintaining amenities. To some extent, there's concerns about schools um, ma maintaining viability. Um, I've heard, I haven't heard that as much this election as I had last, but it's also early days. Um, and, and, you know, and then also issues around downsizing, like, you know, my mom's in the process of building a co-housing project with uh, 20 some other families because she was trying to figure out what she was going to do as she got older and, um, her options were really limited and she wanted to stay in her community. So it's challenging because a lot of the everyone no one wants to pay more than taxes um everyone wants their potholes fixed and they all want their rec center and they all want their um you know waste service to be excellent and and all of these things they want the lawns mode um and they also don't 
typically want to see an increase in densification. There is not a single residential neighborhood in our city that pays for its services out of its tax base, not even all over downtown. And it's the most dense and it's the closest. So I have a conversation with people about trade-offs. You know, like where, where are your values? And, and what is the most important thing that you want to invest in in your community? Um, and, and, and then how do we mitigate the impacts of things that you don't want? Um, and how do we make sure that those are more likely to reflect your values? Uh, and, and, you know, people can wrap their heads around that. One of the, one of the issues is they're like, oh, well, families can't afford to live in our fancy skinny houses. I'm like, well, maybe they could afford to live in the bungalow, but who's, who's selling your neighborhood? Who's marketing your neighborhood to families with kids? Like you're competing with multi-million dollar advertising campaigns for new suburban um, communities that have new schools and new amenities and all of these things. And the houses in our neighborhoods are expensive, even the ones that are, you know, need renovating like mine. Um, we don't have a strong culture of renovation and retrofit, which we really need to change. And, um, and then also we're, we're slowly starting to shift the conversation on the fact that families actually do live in multifamily housing. I have a high rise behind me that I'm pretty sure is keeping my local school open. <laughs> Cause I see the kids coming out every day, but I also know that the largest units are two bedroom and that there's families with two kids in there who are trying to figure out where, how they can stay in the community and are really struggling with finding options. So, so on the doors, it's, it's those usual concerns, you know, about, maintaining infrastructure, about the economy, about taxation, about infill. Um, but when you get into the deeper conversation with folks about what really matters, what matters is they know their neighbors, what matters is they wanna stay in their community. Um, they love that they're close to certain kinds of amenities and services, and, uh, and they love that we have a lot of green space. And so when I hear those things, it's like, okay, so we know that things are going to change. We can't stop it from changing, but we can make sure that we change in a way that means that you can get to know your new neighbors and that we make sure to protect and enhance green space and that we can maintain the, help support the viability of the small businesses and the rec centers and schools and amenities that, that you love. Um, and we might even manage to like, have some housing built that you can move into when you don't want to take care of your yard anymore. <laughs> well, you, you, you mentioned something and I want to pick up on it because as the next counselor, you are the successful candidate on October 18th. Um, as the next counselor for the ward of Papasto, uh, uh, I'm going to keep on pronouncing that until I get it right here uh, <laughs> until it comes naturally off the top of my mm -hmm. tongue. You were there to represent Edmonton. You mm -hmm. are elected at a ward district, but you are there to represent Edmonton. So I've got to ask the question because you will have to sometimes, and a politician saying this word is very highly unlikely, you will have to say no sometimes to some people. Wait. You will have to say, no, we can't afford that. We have to worry about this. Mm -hmm. The needs of the few outweigh the needs of the many, or the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. So how do you envision your first term as the next counselor as working with the communities that you represent but also representing the larger picture of Edmonton because that is what you will be doing as a whole and and again I think that's a place where I have a fair bit of um experience to draw on so I've done a lot of work in community navigating um navigating community change projects and you know people want to fight stuff and they'll contact me out of the blue and say, I understand that you can help me fight this project. And my first response to them is like, you might not like my answer, but actually I probably can't help you stop it. Um, and I would suggest that you may not even want to stop it in the long run, but I can help you navigate the process. And a big piece around the, the saying no is like, we need to have really concrete trade-off conversations about what is possible. Like, so we need to bring people into the process so that they understand 
like we're talking about often highly technical, um, many layered decisions here, often where community doesn't have a lot of say. And, you know, we need to be, make sure that when we're engaging with them, we are setting those parameters around what is possible, but that within those parameters, we really tap into the opportunities for influence, right? So I've, I've said to people, I'm like, you know, if I have had people, because I've supported controversial projects, I have people who I know will not support me this election because I have supported controversial projects. Um, and I've supported them because I have worked to negotiate improvements in those projects. And the alternative was it would get passed anyway without the improvements. Um, and so we can either figure out where the decision-making table is and get to the table and bring community to the table and help figure out what a reasonable negotiation is. Um, or we can, you know, stand at the sidelines. And um, I, part of why I got really interested in organizing work and why I got interested in politics was I didn't want to sit on the sidelines and just protest stuff. That was just felt futile. So, you know, they're saying no. I think sometimes I'd actually think it's sometimes easier to say no to things than it is to say yes, because you say yes to some things and people don't want you to say yes to those things. Um, but either way, you there's you're not going to please everyone. And I think this idea that politics or even like public engagement work is a popularity contest where it's about, you know, making collecting people's opinions and then making the decision based on other people's opinions. That's not leadership. You know, leadership means stepping out in front, which also means that you're going to get more flack. Um, but it means seeing the bigger picture and it means trying to bring people into the process. And, you know, there are people who will never support me because of that approach. Um, and there are lots of people who aren't happy with some of the things that I might stand for or, and I've been, or been very honest with people. That's, and that's another thing. Gotta be honest with people. Don't make promises you can't keep. Yep. You know, like I, 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 I agree wholeheartedly on that. There's so many times that I've talked to politicians and whether it be a candidate and before the show, uh, whether you talk to the candidate and then they say something and you go, no, that's, I know you're lying to me and I know you're not telling me the full truth here. I know that once you get elected, you're going to do something completely different. So I completely understand where you're coming from on that yeah. statement. And, and I mean, so I, I take a bit of a gamble in the sense that, um, it's a lot easier to either like hitch your wagon to some kind of, you know, ramped up issue or, or to use a more inflammatory approach to things. Um, I think you can be fierce and you can fight for what you stand for. Um, and, but you also can be really selective about how you use the sort of like heavy hand. There's times you need to just say absolutely no. And here's the line. Um, but you're going to, you know, when we want to talk about negotiating on development, we need to work with the people doing development. Um, they're the ones building stuff. And if we want it to be better, if we want it to be better designed, we want to incorporate more green space, we want three bedroom units for families, then we need to understand their business. Um, and, you know, like my mom's co-housing project has been not the only experience I've had around this, but a very up close and personal experience of just how challenging the most creative and the best stuff that we want is to build. So, you know, and again, some people will be suspicious of me for wanting to build those relationships with industry and with, um, and with trades and with unions and with um, nonprofits, you know, you name it or with planners or whatever, because that's the other, right? But as long as we just say they're over there and they're the other, we don't understand their business. We don't understand their values. And we're not at the table and we're not able to negotiate something that's going to work for, at least work better for everyone. So when it comes to no, I've said, mm, I might, you know, there's a chance I might be a one-term counselor if I took off too many people. Um, but leadership is about sticking your neck out and bringing people along. And my hope is that when I stick my neck out, I'm honest, like I'm honest about why I'm doing what I'm doing. 
I try to do my best to communicate as clearly as possible what the parameters are of the decision and where we have influence and what makes what's going to work best from my perspective. And at the end of the day, I need to make the best decision, like you said, for the city as a whole. And um, in order to move forward, you know, our collective vision for this place. Um, and I am hopeful that um, our electorate is, um, you know, respects that. And, and like they want, people want someone who listen and who's honest and isn't gonna sell them a bill of goods and also who can help them move through the process. Like I can understand what's actually going on. And so um, I know that I will make decisions that are unpopular. I'm comfortable with that. One of the big things that I, 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 I and this is this is me talking from myself, I, I, I want a, from a candidate, and you might be able to talk a little bit on this, is someone who will at least communicate with the people, someone who will actually tell the people why they've made a decision, whether it be good or bad. How do you describe your own communication style, and how would you bring your communication style to council to ensure what you are doing and what you are saying is actually heard by the people who have put you there. So, you know, you know, you're doing your job when most people don't know what you're doing to some extent, <laughs> right? Yep. Like the reality is that those of us who are really obsessed with municipal politics and all of these decision-making processes is a very small group of folks. Most people have a lot of other things going on in their lives, which means you need to meet them where they're at. And one of the things that I've seen like both on, you know, and I see it across sectors. I see it on community leadership. I see it in industry leadership. I see it in, you know, administration. I see it with counselors. There's a tendency to wait for the problem to come to you. And it's true, everyone's busy, but we need a more, but I really think that we can have a more proactive approach. And part of what I've done, even just as a community member, as a volunteer, for the most part, is when I see something bubbling up, that I'm interested in or care about, like I'm reaching out to the people who are involved and we need to get in earlier. And so the first step of that is at the front end, which is that, you know, instead of looking at something and seeing it bubbling up and saying, I wanna hide my head under a rock, I'm being ostrich for a while till they show up, at, till it shows up at city council. And, um, and I wouldn't say that anybody does that inher like inherently, but I mean, it's a natural tendency. Um, like you need to actually go into the center of, of where that, that conflict is brewing. Um, so one of the things I wanna do is just door knock, like, I mean, Andrew Knack is a fantastic example of this, like door knock all the time. You don't just door knock during elections. The only way you're really gonna hear what people are thinking and what people care about is if you talk to them, especially one-on-one. -on -one. And the way you do that is at the doors. You go to where they are, or it's at the playground, or it's at the coffee shop, or the senior center, um, or the industry gathering. And so you, you really need to listen a lot more um, because then you can catch things earlier. <laughs> so that's the front end. And then on the back end, it's, I mean, it's a similar thing, which is that, yes, you, you do your social media communication and you do your media interviews and you respond to inquiries to your office and I'll maybe write your blog post, whatever, but get on the ground, right? Like on the ground, you go and, 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 you know, when I've had these situations where, you know, I've done something people don't like. Um, I ask people to meet me for coffee and they will still not necessarily like what I've done. But if I can take the time to sort of like walk them through my decision-making process and why I am, do what I do, at least they understand what motivates me and what's informed my decision. And most people have a lot of respect for that. So, you know, it's getting in early and getting onto the ground early but it's also about staying on the ground through the process and being able to communicate um, at that level um, in an ongoing way, not just, not just every four years. So I, I've got to ask the follow-up question. It would be not doing my job if I didn't. <laughs> Do you believe that this council has been more reactive than proactive? 
mostly, I mean, boy, that's a tough question. Um, this council has moved forward on a lot of really high level change documents and processes. And so in that sense, I think they've been very proactive in the sense that they're really pushing the envelope in terms of the high level planning and the sort of what's gonna initiate and trickle down into, um, into our daily decisions if we're doing it right. Um, the challenge now, and I mean, and, and, I, and the challenge all along has been about, um, about that change management piece. And I think, you know, I don't think this, all of this council has been as proactive on sort of seeding those conversations early because this high level visioning work has been, you know, or large planning work has been mostly early um as early as they could and sort of like translating that on the ground and now we're starting to see implementation of some of these things and we're going to see a lot more of that in the next couple of years and that's where like i and i'm honestly concerned because i think that there's a missing piece in terms of um administration's ability to actually do that sort of change work both internally as well as supporting community in it um, so I think we really need leadership from council to sort of drive that um, culture, uh, but also councillors can't do it by themselves. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I mean, in short, um, I wouldn't say they've been particularly just reactive. I think there's been lots of sort of proactive work done, but, but again, it's that translation piece to the community that I haven't seen um, very, I mean, NAC, is, is one of the exceptions I'd say, but you know, that sort of really robust routine engagement on the ground that helps um, helps move these things forward. You, you've mentioned it a few times and I wanna get you on record. And the only reason I'm asking this question is because you've brought it up not once, but, but three times now. Um, <laughs> do you have tough skin to do this job? You talked about Reimer, how you saw women in politics, how it was harsh. I've talked to many women in politics, whether it be counselors, and they say the negative things that they get from people, from social media is ridiculous. Um, you just recently on your Facebook page posted a message that you got from somebody and I, I don't have it in front of me and I would yeah. bring it up, but I wasn't gonna bring this up, but you've brought it up a few times and I wanna know the question, I wanna know the answer. Do you have the, the skin to be in the front lines, in the trenches, in the actual city hall when you're getting these negative things thrown at you? And you're not the only one. Women and men as well get this on a daily basis. So do you have the skin to face these people who are spewing vile stuff at counselors? You know, and again, like when I was 21, I would have said no. Um, and even, you know, and, and that question in terms of like my, um, my heart on my sleeve, sort of, um, empathetic nature, um, it's certainly, it's, it's the thing that has concerned me the most the entire time, but I, uh, and it's funny because I actually had an opportunity to ask Jan Reimer that question about like, I don't know if I have a thick enough skin. And she's like, I don't have a thick skin, but I did develop good calluses. And- um, <laughs> Good quote there. <laughs> I, it's a great quote. And uh, I love it. And then, you know, I was actually, it's funny, my dad asked me this question yesterday. He's like, so Kirsten, do you have a thick, have you developed a thick skin yet? And I'm like, you know, I realized that it's not so much about developing a thick skin as it is about, understanding what's my problem and what's not and 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 really trying to like get a little bit of distance from that I did have a little bit of a baptism by fire because I worked in um, Premier Notley's constituency office for almost two years um I received death threats um and uh got the mountains and mountains of vitriol in our inbox and on our phone and in person and so I, that wasn't of course directed directly at me all the time although one of the death threats was, and some of it was. Um, but, you know, I, I've raised five kids, not completely, like the youngest are 14, but I've had two sets of twins. 
Um, I've done lots of work on myself in terms of my own emotional <laughs> regulation and, and what I've learned. And I think this is sort of the calluses point that Jan Reimer says. It's, it's not so much about not being empathetic or having a soft heart anymore. It's really about good boundaries. Um, and just, and, and just being like, you can, and in fact, I think it's an essential piece. Like we need people with heart, but, but we don't always give, we don't always do a good job of supporting people who have a lot of heart, develop those really clear boundaries and, and, and those, un, that understanding of where the limits are and what isn't, isn't their problem, right? Because we tend to like take on the world and that is work that I have done in my personal life and in my professional life and public life um, for a long time now. And so I spend a lot of time supporting other candidates with how to manage that. And when, and, and my own kids, I'm like, I'm like, is this your problem? Like, is this really your problem? Um, yes, it sucks. And it's okay. And, and your feelings matter. And it's okay. It's important for us to process our feelings about this stuff, but, um, but we, yeah, we need, we need to call it out. Um, and we also need to shut it down, which is like an yeah. interesting juxtaposition. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but again, that's where sort of like those boundaries are like, so I will often, someone will be like snarky with me and I will engage with them first. Um, and I work hard to be kind and clear, um, and also to be clear about what is and isn't acceptable, but I also don't tolerate a lot of it. I, I, you know, at the risk of like being slammed for it, I block routinely, um, not right off the bat because somebody doesn't agree with me. Um, I am happy to have those conversations. Um, but if, if it's just sort of perpetual sort of abuse and harassment, I'm like, no, I don't, I don't owe you an interaction on social media. If you have a real problem, you can send me an email or you can actually articulate what your problem is. But if you're just trying to get a rise out of me, I've given you enough of my time. Good for you. Uh, back to the campaign, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, as much as we can go into that, we're, <laughs> you're here to talk about your campaign. So I, I got to ask the question, what would be a successful first term for Councillor Goa? So I really want the values that we say we espouse in our city plan to be directly articulated in our budget. Um, so How so? So that means saying, okay, we want to build. So from a land use perspective, we want to build, you know, we have these central district areas that we want to build up. Well, that means investing in those neighborhoods and those areas, because in order to accommodate density, we need to look at infrastructure, but we also need to look at things like green space. And we also need to look at things like amenities. And we need to invest in those communities in terms of the change process. So when it comes to taking care of our most vulnerable, um, it means you know trauma-informed um, like training on being trauma-informed. For honestly, I think there's no reason, and in fact, there's lots of good reasons why every single person who deals with the public should have some training on how to be trauma-informed and how to actually work with people, especially in crisis or when they're feeling or when they're angry or whatever, because everyone's at a fever pitch these days and that is not gonna change. So let's equip our administration with the skills to actually navigate that effectively and help our community navigate that. Um, a lot more families living in core mature neighborhoods um, and, and really making sure that we have a mix of housing um, at all levels of affordability as much as possible. And again, these are not all things we're gonna accomplish overnight, but I wanna see some clear movement towards um, communities that are more resilient um, and, uh, and, and some concrete progress on our climate goals. I'll leave it at that. I'm just more, but I'll no, understandable because uh, we like we're at the 45 minute mark here and I wanna wrap up before we uh, do, do our closing here. Um, 
I, I'm going to give you two minutes here. And this is my favorite part of the thing, because I always love hearing what, how, how people answer this question. Why should you be the next counselor for the ward of Papa Stoa in the city Stayo. of Ed, Stayo, Stayo yeah. Yeah. in the, in the city of Edmonton? So this is my home. It's where I grew up. It's where I'm raising my kids. And I want our city and our communities in Pepisteo to be a place where my kids can grow and thrive and their kids can too. Um, I also think that we're at a crux point that is both a significant period of disruption and crisis, but also an amazing opportunity to shape a city that's um, more sustainable economically, more sustainable environmentally, and that does a much better job of taking care of each other. So I've done the work on the ground as a community volunteer for over 20 years. Um, I've had, I, I know the files. I've, I have spent thousands and thousands of hours at City Hall I've built relationships with counselors from across the political spectrum, um, with folks in administration and with folks in community across a wide range of issues. And I have a, I have a track record of having accomplished a lot in terms of city policy while being a community volunteer. Um, and so I want to continue that work and um, take it to the next level, and and you know sort of build power with our communities to actually navigate and shape the changes that are coming. They're coming, they're coming fast and they are scary, but they're also an amazing opportunity to build a great, to continue to build a great place to live. Awesome. Um, and my, uh, get again, I, because this will be airing in uh, September. So there's going to still be a month and a half left until the campaign. How can people get involved? Because you're going to be ramping up your, how can people <laughs> get involved in the campaign? How can people come out and help door knock, ha help hand out literature? Wh wh where can they find you? Ah, well, so I have a website, Kirsten Goa, K I R S T E N G O A dot C A. And you can sign up there for a sign. You can donate online. You can also send an EFT or send a check. There's an address there for that too. Um, you can even, by September, you'll be able to uh, click a button that says, I'm voting for Kirsten, and that would be really helpful. Um, and then, of course, sign up to volunteer. Um, we will be out on doors uh, a lot. And um, I'm also on social media, Facebook page, Kirsten Goa Yeg. Um, Instagram, Kirsten Goa underscore Yeg. So before and, you have to remember all those, we, we will be linking all of those okay. social media <laughs> and the websites in the show notes for anyone yes. who wants to go follow her. I would <laughs> highly recommend it before she has to read out every single letter in the alphabet. Yeah. Well, and, and no guarantees on this. And so we'll have to see, but I was talking with my daughter's friends and her friends last night about trying to rope them into helping me out. So she's 21 friends are in their late teens, early twenties. And, and I said, I'm like, Hey, you guys could share on TikTok." And they're like, could we do a campaign TikTok account? And of course, like I am not on TikTok and I'm not qualified to be on TikTok for so many reasons, but you and there me may both. even be a like young person led TikTok account. We'll see no promises, no guarantees, but, um, Perfect. Um, Kirsten, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, like I said uh, to my listeners and to the viewers, uh, the links to Kirsten's website, Facebook page, Twitter, and Instagram will be in the show notes. Go follow her, sign up, get involved in this election because your vote, your, you can't complain if you do not get it and vote. And uh, Kirsten, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun.